the, um, uh, the area that's challenging for all of us is, is when to use chemotherapy. So let's now shift our conversation to the use of chemotherapy, which really we're using in all subtypes of disease, HER2 positive, uh, ER positive. And certainly for triple negatives, where that's our only option, um, we, we are, have yet to establish a paradigm for what sequence, what drugs we use first. Uh, are some of the newer drugs that are showing benefits in later line actually better when we use them up front? Linda, this has been a very confusing area. You've, you've been involved in a lot of the key trials here. What are your thoughts as to what we should be using up front? And what are the options later on as patients become refractory? I still think that the way that we choose chemotherapy is really a balancing act and that we really have to balance the efficacy and the toxicity. Uh, essentially, if you have a patient who's asymptomatic from their breast cancer, you don't want to make them symptomatic from their chemotherapy and vice versa. So um, I tend to, uh, I still believe that it is, since in the absence of any particular sequence that shows a survival advantage, a significant survival again, not just a paper survival advantage, uh, is to, to coin uh, your paper toxicity comment. Um, I still would favor using drugs up front, which probably don't cause alopecia, um, not too much in terms of nausea, vomiting, um, fairly low on the peripheral neuropathy. Um, and so I tend to use uh, Zolota first line. Um, the only group, subgroup of patients where I will probably think twice about that are the triple negatives. Uh, based on some data that came out of some of the BMS ix ixabepilone and capecitabine trials in, in the uh, triple negatives where Zolota really didn't have, the progression-free survival was like 1.6 months. Um, so to me, that means they pretty much progressed right through it. So, um, so I, that's how I tend to sequence my chemotherapy. Now, aribulin uh, has a survival advantage in the late-line setting, and uh, the advantage is uh, two and a half months. Um, some people believe that that is uh, very important. Others um, don't utilize that information in their decision tree. Um, but certainly, aribulin is very well tolerated. Um, and certainly, there are n a number, there are so many drugs for breast cancer. Of course, never enough when you're looking for one for our patients to respond. So, um, so I think there are, there are definitely a lot of options, and I think the paradigm hasn't changed yet. Now, coming to combination versus monotherapy, it's um, I I think that we need to think about, you know, what are, our, what are our goals? And certainly if you have a patient who needs a response yesterday, I would certainly uh, favor combination therapy because we know from uh, multiple randomized trials that the response rates are greater. So if that's our endpoint, that's, that's what we should do. But I think it's really very individual, and, and I wish there were some guidelines, but as of yet, I don't think that there are that we can really hang our hat on. Well, one thing I was uh, uh, a little bit surprised with is um, that some of the agents that seem to perform better in initial comparative studies or certainly beyond second and third line, when now compared up front in the CALGB study led by Hope Ruger, where we looked at uh, granted different schedules that are FDA approved, primarily weekly schedules of uh, albumin bound paclitaxel and ixabepilone. Uh, uh, and, um, and plain weekly paclitaxel compared really showed that weekly paclitaxel appeared to be the winner. Did that surprise any of you? You know, it actually surprised me a little bit because I thought that, um, I actually thought that ixabepilone would be the better drug based on my clinical experience, um, but it wasn't in, as based in that trial. It was, not, it was a non-inferiority trial, obviously, so. Um, but it's, it, weekly paclitaxel is a good drug. We had done a, um, a randomized phase two. I think it was around um, 120, 140 patients or so. It was a, every three weekly mm -hmm. ixabebolone versus the weekly ixabebolone, and the every three weekly was superior. We had used the 16 mm -hmm. milligrams per meter squared. I think three on, one off. And um, interestingly, the FDA labeled 40 per meter was superior there. And so um, you know. Uh, that was not known at the time that the CALGB study was um, put forward, you know, and so, um, you know, in retrospect, I think, unfortunately, it would have been nice to have the 40 per meter on that, on that arm because it may be a, a bit inferior, the, the weekly might be a little bit inferior. I do think, though, that as patients progress, we're, we're selecting different groups of patients biologically. We're not able to characterize that right now, but it, it may explain why we see different results with different drugs in, in, in different lines of setting. And hopefully, uh, the, the field of molecular oncology may instruct us a little bit on, on, on what's going on.